Good afternoon. We've been talking a lot today about social justice and equity issues. I'm going to draw the connection over the next 15 minutes directly to issues of student success and to one of the most shameful aspects of higher education in the United States today. Um, if we look at this first chart, it's from the New York Times, actually. It's a chart showing uh, the percent of Americans who hold a bachelor's degree, but it's disaggregated by economic quartile. It covers the last 40 years from 1970 to the present. And what you can see is there have been significant changes in bachelor's attainment over the last generation, almost entirely in the upper half of the economic spectrum. If you're among the wealthiest 25% of Americans by annual household income, your prospects of holding a college degree have basically doubled, from 40% to over 80%. But if you're in the, those bottom bands, especially that lowest band, the bottom 25% by household income, it's a very different picture. In fact, it's a shameful picture where we've moved the needle hardly at all. In fact, the gap between the least wealthy and wealthiest Americans is not getting smaller. It's basically doubled over the last 40 years. Now that is in some ways a good introduction to my home campus, Georgia State University, a big urban university. This is not just a pretty picture of the Atlanta skyline. That white building on the right there is our largest academic building. We're mixed into the downtown environment. 32,000 students on that one campus that I'll be addressing this afternoon. And for much of our history, we've been overshadowed by our more prominent peers in the state of Georgia, University of Georgia, Georgia Tech. You heard from one of my colleagues at Emory uh, uh, just a little while ago. What is probably our biggest claim to fame historically is our geography. We have a National Historic Park District uh, kind of uh, slicing our campus in half, Auburn Avenue. Uh, and I work every morning about three blocks from Ebenezer Baptist Church, where the Reverend Martin Luther King was, was pastor, as was his father before him, his birthplace a few blocks up the street from that. So we're living and working in this space that is infused with historical significance. But for much of our history, Georgia State didn't live up to that uh, legacy at all. Uh, these were our so-called success rates uh, a, a little over a decade ago. Overall, our graduation rates hovered around 30%, and we were a classic example of the achievement gaps. Year after year, semester after semester, our white students would outperform our students of color, our upper and middle income students would outperform our low income students. You could set your clock to it. And what makes the story of Georgia State interesting and hopefully a little bit inspiring is that what's happened in the decades since those numbers were locked in would not suggest that we would be the site of some kind of transformation. We were going through significant demographic shifts. 15 years ago, we were 60% white. Now we're 65% non-white. We have no majority population. Our largest student group is our African-American population, around 39%. And more than that, we were going through significant financial shifts with the resources our students have available to them. The recession hit Atlanta and hit the state of Georgia very hard, and quite frankly, hit the type of students who enroll at Georgia State, mostly low income, first generation, and now students of color, a lot harder than it did their counterparts at Georgia Tech or University of Georgia. And so their families were the ones losing jobs and uh, losing homes and so forth. And what happened is we had a doubling of our Pell population over basically a five-year period. This past year at Georgia State, we enrolled a total of 26,000 Pell students, one university. Put that in some kind of perspective, the entire Ivy League combined enrolled 10,000 uh, Pell students. So it's not going to be business as usual. Business as usual is not going to work at an institution that has gone through these kind of demographic changes. And oh, by the way, the recession also meant that we had $40 million cuts in our state appropriations. Our SAT scores have gone down by 29 points on average over this time period. Not the usual thing that a vice president would stand up and brag about. But it does set up the question that I want to pose for all of us this afternoon. And it's a question that Georgia take, State began to take seriously. It would have been easy to blame the decline in state appropriations, to blame K through 12 for the fact that we were basically failing our students. But instead, we asked a simple question. Are we the problem? Under the leadership of our president, Mark Becker, we became much more data-centered. And we began to unearth problems that we were creating that were causing the issues that our students were facing in, in large dropout rates. One example is summer melt. We had about 20% of our freshman class in the summer of 2015 who melted away during the summer. These are not students who confirmed they were coming to Georgia State and ended up attending some other institution. These are students who got into Georgia State, confirmed they were coming, and ended up attending no institution. 
They just didn't go to college. We use national student clearinghouse data to track them. And look at the profile of these students, almost 300 students. They're exactly the kind of students we need to succeed with in the United States. Low income, predominantly students of color, and really good high school candidates. But we were doing something that was preventing them from taking that final step and matriculating. And we began to analyze what we were doing. And it's not just Georgia State, but it's all of higher education. Imagine any 17-year-old completing the FAFSA, the application for financial aid on their own, let alone a first generation low income student. And then you add to it things like the verifica verification processes, which are highly inequitable in the way they're distributed across the economic spectrum. If you're the son or daughter of a middle class family, um, parents uh, file a joint return, you're very unlikely to get a verification uh, follow up from the federal government. If you're being raised by grandma because your dad is not contributing to the finances of your family, you're going to get a verification request. And what 17-year-old, again, of any economic class is going to handle that kind of request successfully in the summer between high school graduation and the beginning of college? And for a subset of our students, they were taking that request, putting it in their pocket, and saying, I guess I'm not going to college after all. So we began to change ourselves. We set up a new uh, a smart texting system, a platform, where after the students are admitted, we ask all kinds of questions you would never ask on a college application. Are you working? Do you contribute to the finances of your family? Do you have a disability? What course in high school did you really hate? And we use that to begin during the summer to target specific messaging to students that's much more personalized than we were able to deliver in the past. We now have a portal. Students sign on to it, and it takes them through 15 or so steps that they need to complete between graduating from high school and starting that first day of class at Georgia State. But now, because it's a portal, we can track where they are in this progression and make sure we can reach out with specialized help. And probably most impactfully, we started using a chatbot. A chatbot is an AI-enhanced uh, intelligence texting platform. So it takes questions in a knowledge base, common answers to questions that were often asked, and allows students to text 24-7 and get responses to the questions they might have. We thought we might have a few thousand hits on this new platform when we launched it last summer. In the three months leading up to the beginning of fall classes this past summer, for just the incoming freshman class alone, we had over 200,000 questions answered by the chatbot. Average response time was seven seconds. So do these kind of changes make a difference when it comes to the real goal, which is getting more students to succeed? And indeed, they do. In one year, we reduced summer melt by 22%. That translates to an additional 300 students, mostly low income and first generation, who rather than sitting out the college experience, were in their classes at the first day of class at Georgia State last fall. Another problem, overwhelming students with choices. We ran our data. We found the average Georgia State student five years ago was going through two and a half majors before they graduated. Whose fault was that? Was it their fault or ours? We were overwhelming them with choices, 90 majors, 3,000 courses. You heard uh, President Crow this morning talk about 400 majors at Arizona State. Great when it comes to marketing, but how overwhelming is it for a student who comes in and has to make the right choice? And if they don't, they're going to bounce around different majors, creating waste, wasted credit hours, added time to degree, added debt load. So we've changed the way we onboard all our students. They now uh, have a portal that is available to them with live job data. They can see this even before they enroll. If they put on their application they're interested in nursing, we share with them live data from the metro Atlanta area about what's the starting salary if you have an associate's degree in nursing. What's the starting salary if you have a bachelor's degree? And like Amazon or Netflix, we spin out other. You like this book, you might like these other things. If you like nursing, you may be interested to know we have a degree in uh, health informatics. We have a degree in radiologic technology. And uh, begin to expose students to these opportunities. Then once they get to class, we enroll them all in learning communities, groups of 25 students who take all their first semester classes together. And these learning communities are organized around so-called meta majors, these large buckets, these thematic areas like STEM and business where the students will be uh, seated with other students who share that interest so we can push programming at the students throughout the freshman year. The uh, departments will have open houses and alumni panels and so forth. So students, when they make a choice, make an informed choice. Does this kind of intervention make a difference? Well, according to our data, it does. In the three years after we launched this program of requiring meta majors and learning communities, we had a 32% drop in students changing their majors in their sophomore, junior, and senior years. And then what about another problem, which was we had many students dropping out without ever getting academic help. 
So we engaged in a big data project. We used 10 years of our data over two and a half million grades. We looked for risk factors in the data, in, in, in the historical record. What uh, uh, led students to get off path and begin to uh, go down the, the pathway of dropping out. We found over 800 different things with historical significance, and now we're tracking them every day. This may seem intimidating for those of you who may not have the big data at your fingertips, but the good news is what we've discovered over the last five years is the sorts of things that are most impactful are just common sense interventions. If a student is withdrawing or dropping a class in the middle of the semester, intervene at that moment and see why they're dropping the class. They've paid for it. Why are they leaving the class? Or if you have these maps, as most campuses do, this is our chemistry map of the pathway students are supposed to follow, why don't you actually check and make sure when they register for class that they're following the map. We had 2,000 cases last year where students had signed up for courses that didn't apply to their degree program. And look for early warning signs. We found one of the best is the first grade a student gets in his or her major. This is actual data from Georgia State. If you're a political science major and get an A or B in your first political science course, you're graduating at over a 75% clip. You get a C in that first class, you're graduating at only a 25% clip. But how often have any of us as campuses reached out to that C student immediately and said, let's try to get you help before you take the upper level classes and begin collecting uh, Ds and F. The trick to all of this is doing it at scale. And over the last 12 months at Georgia State, we've had 52,000 52,000 one-on-one interventions between our advisors and our students that were prompted by alerts coming out of this advising platform. Does this advising platform make a difference? Again, it does. We launched it in the summer of 2012. We immediately saw a significant increase in our overall retention rates, and the biggest gains were by the students who struggled the most under the old system. Our transfer students, our part-time students, our adult learners, our military learners, the students who traditionally sail under the ra radar screen and don't get our best attention and best support. We've seen a significant decline since we launched this platform in 2012 in the average time to degree. So it's taking students half a semester less to complete all their requirements. We haven't lowered the requirements. They're just getting through them more efficiently. That saves students about $15 million a year. The graduating class this year compared to the graduating class four years ago, just from tuition and fee savings. And perhaps most surprisingly, we've seen different behaviors than was anticipated. A lot of our faculty thought these analytics would push students to the easiest major because we're advising them based on their chances of success. What we found, because we're intervening so early, is that students are now succeeding in our toughest majors. Every year since we've had this platform in, in effect, we've set new rate, uh, records for the number of STEM majors graduating who are from uh, minority groups, African American, low income, Latino, and so forth far outpacing uh, the enrollment. And because this work has uh, been successful at Georgia State, we are engaged in a $10 million, 10,000 student random controlled trial with our fellow uh, campuses in the University Innovation Alliance to test this nationally to see if we can get similar results from this kind of program. This, the, these type of interventions don't need to break the bank. In fact, in these difficult financial times, especially for public universities, this has been a savior. Every one point we increase our retention rate, that's about $3 million in additional annual revenues in tuition and fees. Holding on to students is not only the right thing to do, it's also the fiscally prudent thing to do. But I do want to close by emphasizing the social justice aspect of this. This really is the right thing to do. We have a moral obligation to try to get our act together and serve our students better. And this is the reason why. We're up over 1,700 degrees, bachelor's degrees we're conferring a year over the last five years alone. That's a 30% increase and to be celebrated, but then look at this. Where are the gains coming from over the same five years? The gains are coming from all the students we were failing most under the old system. These are the students who have benefited from this kind of attention because these were the students who in the past had the most difficulty navigating the insane bureaucracy that we have created. Our graduation rates that I started with a few minutes ago, they haven't gone up incrementally. They've gone up exponentially. We've more than doubled the graduation rate for our black and Latino students. We've tripled them, by the way, for our African American male students. And if you track our students across multiple institutions, over 75% are getting degrees on time from some institution, and there's no achievement gap. Last year at Georgia State, our black, our Latino, our first generation, and our Pell students all graduated at or above the rate of the student body overall, the only public university at which that was the case. 
And one last note here, my final slide, is just to point out that this institution in the shadow of the historical site of Martin Luther King that once was segregated and uh, as recently as a decade ago was uh, failing its students of color now confers more bachelor's degrees to African American students than any other college or university in the United States. So these, yeah, yeah, that is worth it. Thanks. So my message is these uh, steps are not uh, wildly out of reach. These are common sense interventions delivered at scale. And we all have the moral obligation as uh, uh, higher education leaders to do just that. Thank you very much.